What I want to do tonight, and as if you read chapter 7 as we're going through, basically what Kerry Smith, the author, did is he went through and he went talked about the gospel, what the gospel is, what the gospel means. He talked about what it means and God's love for us and all of that. He called it Jesus' loss, and really it's the heart of the gospel. So what I want to do tonight is I'm going to just walk through. Now what, some might, you, when you first look at it, you might call this a little elementary, I like to call it foundational, although this is the premise, because I believe that if we have a wrong view of the gospel and a wrong view of what it means, I think we miss out on a lot of what God's trying to do in our life. I also think that if we have the wrong view of salvation, for instance, to me, I think we can have the wrong view that the gospel ends. I get saved, and that's it, and we don't realize how the gospel goes so much more to, um, well, I have to do all these things and be really good to get God to accept me. That in itself, again, is a very wrong thinking. So I think helping us to have an appropriate view of the gospel. Now, Kerry Smith in the book went through and he talked about Peter's conversation with Jesus. And Jesus says, lovest thou me more than these? And really what he was pushing was Peter comes, and you think about it, in his mind, and rightfully so, he had every reason to believe that Jesus was going to scold him and be upset with him and say, I'm done with you. That was Peter's opinion, and probably in his mind made sense. Thank you very much, sir, our favorite person right there with the water. Um, but P- Peter comes on the shore and gets a very, very different conversation. And what he gets is he gets significance. He says, just because you've messed up doesn't mean that God won't still use you or doesn't want to still use you. And so they walk through a lot of this. So what I'm going to talk tonight about is the simple aspect of the gospel. Now, let me ask you this question. We use the term the gospel. Someone give me the basic description or definition. When I say the gospel, what does that mean? Okay, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we call them the gospels. We talk that because it talks about the gospel. There's one other definition to it. When I say, yes. Okay, the good news, the salvation, which is seen in in these four books. I'm going to branch the term out more tonight when we talk about the gospel. So we think the gospel coming from the four gospels where it was introduced, talking about the good news, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the truth, what Jesus did on the cross. But I, I, what I want to do is I want us to dig deeper and a little bit wider than just salvation. So we all understand that salvation is something that's given to us. We cannot earn it. It comes from the cross. But I want to just, and again, some of this will be familiar with, but to you, but I want us to branch out further. And I believe if we get a full understanding of the entire premise of the gospel, we're going to finish with some scripture that I think digs deeper and helps us understand God's view of us when it comes to identity, why God's doing some of what he did. We talked about loss and how God has to deconstruct our opinion of ourselves before he can have his thumbprint on us, that he can put his identity in our lives. Tonight we're showing a video in youth group. It's done by the skit guys. Um, And normally when you watch the skit guys, you see humor. And I love watching the skit guys, they're hilarious, but one of this one is actually very serious. And it's called uh, God's Chisel. And so it's a skit, they do, but it talks about the one guy says, God, I, wanna, I want you to do great things in my life. I want you to make me something better. And then the other guy appears being God, and he uses a hammer and a chisel and pretends or you know, visualizes chiseling away the things in your life you don't like. And the other guy's like, this hurts. I don't like this. And it's more about us being daily conformed into the image of Christ. And the premise is that if we're ever going to look like the Son of God, we have to get rid of the things that make us look more and more like the world. And so the idea is we need to get rid of our identity so that God can place His Son's image into our life. And that mostly comes with this idea of the gospel. So in the book, Kerry Schmidt puts it this way when he describes the gospel. He said, the gospel is the story of the Bible is a single plot line that points to Jesus and the gospel story. From the first page of Genesis to the last page of Revelation, the Bible is God's story of redemptive history. What God has done and is doing in history to redeem us, to bring us back to himself, and to remake us. I like the phrase of the idea of the redemptive history. Now we look at that. We've been separated and God, the entire, from from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation, it all points to one thing. And and, and there are some who wouldn't agree with this completely, but I think it, to me, it's, it's common sense. From Genesis 1 
all the way to the Revelation, it all points to one thing. What does all of the Bible, if you agree with me on the point, what is, it, what is the one focal point that everything points to in the Bible? Jesus, all right, and, well, Jesus' work on the cross, his redemptive work. Old Testament through the sacrifices are always pointing to that. New Testament's looking back to it. The center focal of everything we believe is his work on the cross. And not just, okay, I believe in this cross and I'm saved. Because sometimes we think that the gospel happens at one time in our life and then we move on. And we, it's semantics. We move on to sanctification, which I believe is part of the gospel. But if we understand more of what's going on there, I think it gives us a better understanding of what God's doing and why why we battle with it sometimes. So he makes a comment about what Peter's identity, what he's giving to Peter in the book, and he says this. He, we're receiving acceptance, security, and significance. He said this. This is the good news that Jesus brought to all humanity. You can't save yourself. I will do it. You can't reinvent yourself. I will recreate you. You cannot secure yourself. I will secure you. He died to make it possible. So this is the key. He gives us acceptance, he gives us security, and he gives us significance. And that's the broader view of what we call the gospel. So, remember we talk about the idea that the world sometimes, and Christianity sometimes think, I need to do enough to be accepted by God. If I do enough, then God will be pleased with me. And we know theologically and theoretically it's not like that, but sometimes we feel like that. You ever felt like, I haven't prayed in a while, and so i got to kind of make up for all this prayer before I can come to God? I haven't done enough good works, and maybe I'll do enough for God to accept me or love me. Or maybe this, things seem to be falling apart, and you ever wonder, God, maybe I'm not doing enough to see you work in our life. And whether we believe that down deep, sometimes that hits us. But yeah, if we understand what we're going to look at tonight, he gives us um, salvation, he gives us acceptance, loves us as we are, security that we never have to search for. He's never going to turn his back on us. And then significance. Who we are, no matter our past, God's got something for it. But see, religion says God is attracted to someone who's valuable. Relationship said God is attracted to our weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Paul said this. Remember Paul asked, was it three times that God removed the thorn of the flesh? Most of us believe a problem with his eye. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul responds this. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I either glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He, this is what God said to Paul. My strength is made perfect in weakness. God's goodness and grace in my life, his great strength is seen not by how good I am, but by how he works through my weakness. So the thing we say, I'm not good enough for this, or I make mistakes, or I struggle on this, all those things. Here's, here's how the guys in the video put it. We're going to show later. You look in the mirror. You know, we're really good at coming to church, trying to make it look like we know what we're doing when we come to church. But when we look in the mirror, and all we see is just, it's just you know, me in the mirror and God, often we don't really like what we see. Because we have an opinion of what we hope to look like, or we're frustrated. We haven't accomplished. And God says, it's that weakness that I want to work through. It's that weakness that I want to to let my strength be seen. God's not looking for amazing people to do amazing things. God's looking for just people to be available which to whom he can do amazing things. He's working through our weaknesses. Growing up my entire life, since I can remember, my life first has always been Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I remember I was called to preach when I was real young. From that moment, I was scared to death. I was a bit of an introvert. Uh, a bit of a speech impediment. I uh, didn't, I was nervous in front of people. And at 11 or 12, I'm like, I got to preach. What? And I remember I got asked to preach in children's church. And, I, you know, kids are great to preach to, but they're also the first ones to laugh. They don't think about it when you mess up. You're like, that's great. Uh, they don't see it. We as adults, we catch that. We're like, Argh. we cover it up or something like that. You know, teenagers, they just catch you afterwards. You notice you messed that up. It's all the different realms you're working with. But I remember, Lord, I, I was scared. I knew this was what God wanted me to do. But I'm like, Lord, I don't have and all these things in my mind. And God said, that's exactly what I'm looking for is your weakness to be used. So let's go real quick. I'm going to kind of break down the idea of the gospel and start with history's greatest battle. So let me, let me start. I'm going to try and do this by asking questions instead of just lecturing stuff we already know. 
All right, so let me, I'm going to ask a very broad question, see if we can go back as far as we're hoping to go. Jesus came to the cross for what purpose? What was the ultimate reason that Jesus had to come to the cross? Save us, all right, take it, go back for further, yes? Okay, take away our sins. Okay, make it accessible to get to God. That is the ultimate reason. What I want to do is take one more step further. All right, we talk about where did sin come from? Okay, he effectively undid the choice. Let's start it back. Let me ask you a question. Do we blame Adam for our sin? No, blame Adam for his sin, all right? Because uh, I'm guessing all of us probably would have still taken of that fruit in the garden. That's going to be my guess. Kyle and I were talking about this Sunday. Let me ask you a question. This is off topic, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. How long do you think it was from creation to the time they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil? That's what most people think a week, right? Do you know we don't know here? Well, here's one reason. Time didn't exist probably. Remember, he says, if you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. Did they die right away? How, what happened? They started aging, which brought death. Which means if they'd never eaten, they would have never aged. They would have stayed that way. That's how humans, humans were created in the glorified body we're looking forward to. Sin came and sin started the aging process that took them to the grave hundreds of years later. That's the whole point. So up to the, it literally, we, we could have been thousands of years in the garden. It could have been a week. We don't know. We assume it because we see our nature. I, I don't know. I've always wondered that. Um, I've had some people say it was the next day. I'm like, man, you have Adam and Eve. It's really bad. All right? You know, maybe after a while they stared at the fruit long enough. I don't know. Uh, either way, sin. Now here's the point. Sin comes in. Sin came from our decisions. God had to come to the cross. I'm going to try to take one step deeper. So sin's there, but when sin came, what happened? I'm kind of rewording what was something that was already said. God and Adam and Eve walked in the garden face to face, and then sin came. What happened when sin came? It was a separation. Basically, the greatest battle since. I want you to consider something. God is perfect, right? Can God look on sin? No, which is why he could no longer just walk in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve anymore. It all had to be some type of shit if we want to use a religion to get it connected. It came through the sacrifices, and that was the Genesis, started the picture of what was looking forward to the cross. It came in the tabernacle, in the temple, the three sections, the holy of holies, the holy place where only the Ark of the Covenant was, only the high priest can go. Why? It was separating us. This is the battle. This is why Christ had to come. It was separate. Now, we don't acknowledge this a whole lot, especially if you've been saved for a while. You don't, you don't catch this. If you got saved when you're older, you get this a little more. Because I, I was saved at the age of five. And before that, I was in a pastor's home. All right, so, you know, I, I was afraid to get in trouble of anything at below five. So there wasn't this massive, you know, I came out of this drunken, drug-filled life at the age of five. That didn't necessarily happen. So I don't have this massive story of life transformation at the age of five. But I talk to some people who were saved later, and I love hearing the transformation of the gospel because it wasn't something they did. That separation from God was removed. And that's the point of the gospel. The Old Testament is God's redemptive story pointing us to what he's doing. My sin, my struggle. Here's the problem. I deserve to go to hell. How many sins does it take for us to deserve to go to hell? One. I, I was reading something. Um, Tim Keller, there's a pre uh, preacher, he said this. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dare believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dared hope. So we've got this separation because of sin. Now I want you to consider, I mentioned, I think it was Sunday I mentioned this. We all often think if our good outweighs our bad, we can get to heaven. And my opinion is if we think our good can outweigh our bad, we don't have a full understanding of how bad bad is, how bad sin is. If doing some nice things and giving some money outweighs sin, then why would Jesus have to go to the cross? I mean, that's a pretty serious punishment. He says, the wages, the punishment of sin is death. 
we deserved hell. So what was necessary? What was the only payment that could possibly be given for sin? Is that sinlessness, the shedding of blood? I was waiting for someone to say death. I think they're all afraid to say it, all right? Kyle? Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> so let me go into this. Was it the death of Christ that brought salvation? I know, it's kind of a trick question. No, it was the blood of Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It's the blood of Christ that brings remission. Interestingly enough, do you know more than once P, uh, Satan had a group of people trying to kill Jesus when he walked the earth? Remember one time they tried to throw him off a cliff and he just disappeared from the crowd? Why? Because Satan knew the pattern. His death is not the problem. It's his blood we've got to deal with and so we'll kill him before he can get to the cross. He's got to fulfill all the prophecies. And so there is this sinless, what's known as the lamb, because he's the picture of the Old Testament lamb. His answer was to take a major loss. Jesus had to die. Again, we, we recognize this. This is stuff we teach elementary. This is stuff we, we, when we give the gospel. And let me tell you one of the reasons I'm going through this. One, I think it's important to be remember, reminded of this. Two, you ever been asked a question and, you know, I sometimes say, I wonder if I can connect all of this. My goal is to try and help us to connect all of this together, to understand. So we talk about how bad a person is. Well, they're so bad they can't, go to, they can't get saved, and we understand that there is not a good or bad in this. So I'm going to take a minute and walk through some Scripture that I want us to evaluate tonight. We see the plan. The first one is Hebrews 12.2. Hebrews 12.2. I don't know if you want to look it up, but we starts in, I won't, I'm just going to read verse 2. Hebrews 12.2 says this, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's an awful lot of theology in this verse. And so I'm going to walk us through and see if you know, you might already know some of these answers. So he starts off, verse 2, looking unto Jesus. And he starts off by the verse 1. He says, wherefore, we are compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses. And so because of all of the, the heroes of the faith in verse chapter 11, we're surrounded by those who have gone before us. The testimony of what we can do, we need to step out in faith. How do we do it? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So let me ask you a question. What does he mean by the author and finisher of our faith? Because that phrase is not just a trite phrase. There's a lot behind it. Okay. Okay, he knew before. You think think about the I love the fact that he uses the word author. When you think about an author, author before writing a book, they designed the whole idea, right? Who was the one that once sin came in created the plan to get out of it? He authored it. When Adam chose to sin, God said, You have sinned, and I am going to create a plan for you to get out. God didn't come to the garden and say, how dare you? Let me ask you a question. I'm jump back. To, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Here, yo, she jumped into the car. Okay. If God knows everything, how come he didn't know Satan would do this? So let me ask you a question. Did God know Satan would do that in the garden? Yes. Let me tell you something interesting. Just another verse. I'll jump off tackle for a second. John 1.1. 1, 1. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. What does that mean? In the beginning was the Word, the Bible, and the Word, the Bible, was God. Before the earth was created, this had already been pre-planned. God knew what was going to happen in Genesis 1-1 before Moses ever penned it. Now, here's the debate. Because you get into what we call the sovereignty of God. Do we believe that God is in control of everything and sovereign? Yeah, okay. Then why would he create a garden and put a snake in there and put a tree in there if he knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin? Why would he do it? Does that make him a vindictive God? It makes him a lo okay, loving God. Kyle, I know you want to say it. <laughs> I can see it on your face. Okay, let's go back to the question. Why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Hmm? To test them? Okay. Okay. 
Here, here, you know when they, get, when they ate of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, what did they gain? They gained the knowledge of evil. All right? You can't worship something without a choice. You don't worship God if it's forced on you. Go ahead. No, because he knew exactly, he, he told them. Trick implies they didn't know what was going to happen if they did it. So here, here let's picture this. Because what we do is I think we have a tendency to look at the entire picture of the garden from, for example, from, I'm sorry? You can say it that way. Let me give you an example. Uh, maybe you believe this. I believed this most of my life, and then when I look back on it, it was just an opinion. Any of you ever believed that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the best fruit in the garden? You ever think that? The best tree? You know there's nowhere in the Bible that says that? There's no, see, there's so much about the garden we've put in because we heard it in a story, we watched it on TV, or we assume. Here's the problem. Do you really think God held out the very best from them in the garden? The garden is utopia. It's a, it is the, it, no place in the world like it exists now. Here's what I'm saying. You know what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was? Just another tree. It wasn't the best. It was just one of the trees. It just happened to be the one they were asked not to eat of. Yes? So did we put that there so they didn't have Yes. So here's what happens. You say, did they trick up? No. Because when God created Adam, he created Adam, and then he gave him, and you have to remember, we look at that story and all we see is the tree. Well, to trick him, I'll get, I'll get back to that in a second. I, yeah, because I, I jumped back further, but you got a good point. You didn't trick him, but there's a good question. So if you look at the garden, we look at the tree, because that's the story, right? Can you, can you picture the... There's nothing in our world that compares to the Garden of Eden, and that's what they got to live in. And in the corner, or in the one little spot, there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That wasn't the center folk. I mean, this place was amazing. And yeah, don't eat of that. So frankly, it probably was easy not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because there was so much more out there. So after they ate of it, why did God say, where I hide it to? Kyle, you got something? Okay. All right. Okay. Which? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And I tell you, we know that today. If, if, if you were to put five things out and you're told you can eat these three, but you can't touch the other two, what are you going to want to eat? It's human nature to go, I mean, unless it's broccoli, but it's human nature to go to certain things. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so he's talking about the whole thing's obedience from the beginning. Jesus, when he went to the cross, was obedient to God. Even though they're one, he was obedient, subservient to the, God, the Godhead of the Trinity. And so he's wanted obedience. You can't have obedience unless there's an option to disobey. So it wasn't a trick, yes. Okay. Again, for, right. So then let's go back to the first question I started with. Why did he ask them in the garden, where are you? Did Jesus know where they were? Yeah. Yes, he did. All right. And why did he do it? Okay, simply this. What's that? He wanted them to come forward. Okay, that's all it is. Yeah. He wanted them to take responsibility for their actions. I mean, come on. This, Adam's been walking with God for who knows how long, and now he thinks a few bushes is going to hide him from Almighty God? This is how stupid sin makes us. Right? This is the way it is. I mean, he's sitting over there like, God's not going to see me. I mean, he's the first man. He watched him create his wife. I mean, hello. I mean, he got to see what we can only imagine. And somehow he thought hiding, you know, it's like a little kid hiding behind a tree like dad's not going to find me. That's how silly it is. And God walks down there. Where are you? Simple. Adam was to step out and take responsibility. It was the first step to remember, Adam, you sin. Now you have to own up to the consequence of your actions. And by the way, there's things all through our life today we can choose to do 
that have consequences, some good and some bad, right? We, some of them we choose not to. We get, I, I think some people think that God set Adam and Eve up to fail in the Garden of Eden, and uh, I don't believe that. I, I don't, and by the way, if God just created us without a free will to worship, do you know he already had a being like that? The angels. Who, who then chose a bunch of them to rebel and leave heaven? Remember, we are very different than the angels. We, have, we can repent and come back. The angels don't have that choice. So looking unto Jesus, he authored. When he saw this happening, he authored a plan. Now here, catch this. Man chooses to sin. God creates a plan that results in his son dying. You begin to see automatically the love that's put right there? Because here's the other battle with the gospel. God is holy, which means he demands justice, Right? So if someone commits a crime in America, a bad crime, should they go to jail for it? I know it's a political question today, depending on how bad the crime, right? But if, if you commit a crime, should you go to jail? Yes. Or justice has not been served. So if sin is real and God is holy, should sin be punished? So God is holy, which means he demands sin to be dealt with, but he's also the one who's loving, who's going to solve the problem. It's almost contradictory. It's like the judge who's going to put you in jail gives you a way out. But the actual picture is even better than that. This is one of the coolest parts to me. If you look at the picture of the judge, of the courthouse. So the judge, who's the, he's, on the th- he's up on the bench, he's got the robe or she's got the robe on, and they're about to place you in jail for your crime, and you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail for murder or whatever it is. The picture in here is that the judge looks down and says, you are sentenced to, and there's a sentence. And then the judge takes off their robe, walks down off the bench, and takes the place of you, and then does your time. That's the picture. The judge establishes a sentence and then serves it out. It's not saying you're free to go. That's mercy, but that's not justice. You see the difference? God says you're free to go. It's mercy, but justice hasn't been served yet. The person you've wronged has not received justice. So justice still has to be done. So it's not mercy. It's grace. He takes the place. Can you imagine a judge today coming off the bench and taking the place of a criminal? But here's one of the reasons, like when I read the quote from Tim Keller, that I think we miss today. I don't think we today, especially in American Christianity, understand the reality of how bad sin is. We feel guilty time, but we don't understand the reality of sin. Sin was bad enough to place God on the cross. And we look back, yeah, for Judas or other people, but in today's day and age, it's just not sometimes as serious. And I don't think we should walk around constantly in tears over our sin, but I think sometimes we miss the reality of what it cost for us to have what we have. I was at, let me ask this question. I was asked years ago by a Catholic priest. I was debating him. A teenager asked me to come in and debate his former priest. And I, I, mentioned his, I mentioned this, and he, thought, he asked me a question. So I was talking about, he asked me how I believe we got salvation. I said, I believe it came by grace through faith. He goes, you don't have to do anything. I said, not of yourself. Then I quoted Ephesians 2, which he was aware of. He said, so you're telling me that your salvation is free. I said, Yes. He goes, sounds pretty cheap and pretty empty to me. What do you say to that? That our salvation is cheap and empty because it was free. It goes, yes, sir, Steve. Yeah, taking the form of a servant. Yeah. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, talk about, uh, Philippians talks about that. He took on the form of a servant, made him in the likeness of men. He stepped down in human mankind to take that position. So I'm trying to think where I was right before that. Um, Allah. Okay, All right, thank, thank you very much. All right. So the, the comes down to, he came down at a great cost but it comes down to the understanding of a gift. You, 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 know when you, you know when you give someone a gift and you really hope they like it? It's usually not the thing you bought at the dollar store, right? You know, if you, got, if you spend a lot of money 
If, if you buy, let's say you go spend a lot of money on a gift and you give it to that person, they don't like it. You get a little annoyed by it? Okay. What if they regifted it and you got it back for the next birthday? <laughs> like, Wait a minute. So I've always decided to buy really nice gifts in case it gets regifted back to me. I always, you know what, get what you want. So, you know, instead of buying my wife Julie, I buy technology in case it comes back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but and so it's regifted, always buy the one I want. Anyway, the point is, what I, and I say to this, same idea. I talked about what Jesus did, the sacrifice necessary, because that sacrifice comes down to the gift. Salvation is not cheap because it's free. Frankly, the word free is misleading. It's a gift. And gifts are rarely free. Oh, they're free to me, but they are by themselves very expensive. You ever seen those, those commercials around Christmas where you walk out and they've got a, a Lexus wrapped up in a bow? Uh, if anybody I, you, ever does that, I film it. I want to see it, all right? And I got a lot of questions, okay? Uh, the person you gave it to, are they making the payments on it? Did you pay it off? I got a lot of questions on that. But that you look at it, you say, oh, they're free. Oh, no, no, no. It's cool, but it's not cheap. And that's the premise. The idea that because salvation is free to me, it's cheap and empty is misleading. And sometimes we get that. And again, I don't think we should feel guilty over this, but if we don't understand truly the cost of salvation, we miss really how much God really loves us. You grew up in American Christianity, especially you got saved younger, you, you kind of miss the reality of the cost of what it was for Jesus to give us what we have. You see, what's the point of that? The gospel centers on God's love for me no matter what. You know what it says in Romans? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we promised to become better. In the depths of our sin, Christ went to the cross. So he said, look at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The uh, verse says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What joy was set before Jesus that would make him go to the cross? Us, right? There's a lot of answers. Well, not a lot, but there's more. There's, there's several points to this. Go ahead, Steve. You got one? Okay. All right. One day. Well, he looked forward to the day that we'd stand. We talked about Sunday night, the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'd stand right there. Yes, okay. It starts with satisfying obedience to the Father. He could see visually the separation between God's creation and God. He went to the cross to solve it. That's why the phrase, he used the phrase to tell us that it is finished from the cross. There's so much behind that phrase. And one of it was this gap between us and God had been eliminated. And we can now come into the presence of God. Yes. Yes. Yes.
know, I can see where you're coming from. The one tricky part, we know that God is omnipotent and omnipresent and omniscient, so he knew everything ahead of time. Whether he, uh, I would say, he, he came from outside of time to come inside of time to recognize it. I mean, the best way to kind of look at it is we say he knows the past and present. He can see all time and at one point. So when, he looked at, when we look at Revelation, we study what's coming. God's already seen. I mean, experienced the end. Um, I think he recognized, the, I guess you look back and say, did he come down because he recognized the separation? Here's what I do know God recognized, is that there is only, the reason Jesus went to the cross is no one could be perfect to the cross. No one could get to the cross sinless, which was necessary, which is why his son was the plan. Uh, we have a lot of good people in our world, and if we're good, outweighed or bad, you could do that, but the, uh, the sacrifice had to be sinless, not good, but sinless. I don't know, it's, I understand where you're coming from. The tricky answer is it's hard for us to try and put human thinking into the mind of God. If you, know, you know where I'm coming from. So um, I think he saw it. I think he feels it. I will say this. Jesus, well, the reason he came down to the earth was that the Bible said he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He came to the earth in human form to be able to experience what he would not have otherwise. So he chose to put himself in that situation, mostly so we could relate to him. You, it's hard to relate to a God who's never experienced what you're going through. So he sent Jesus down to relate, live like us. Now, here's an, another question. I'm going to jump too far, but the, we, there's, a, there's a term we use in theology called the impeccability of Christ, which states the question is, could Jesus have sinned if he wanted to? So I asked that question. Do you believe if Jesus wanted to, which he wouldn't have, do you think he could have sinned when he walked the earth? I don't know. Some people, they feel like Jesus, he could have, he should have been able to sin if he would have felt. No, he was tempted, yet without sin. I don't believe Jesus could have sinned. He was 100% God. He could not have sinned. But the human side definitely connected. He says in Hebrews, he was in all points tempted like was we are. So and the best way I can give the answer is that he knew it all coming, but for us to be able to make that connection humanly, he sent Jesus down to complete what you're talking about. So his thinking behind it, I, I don't know, but I do know that he understood our need to make that connection why Jesus came. So that's a, that's a good question. And uh, I hope, I don't know if I answered it completely for you, but I think it's a good question. So um, make sure nobody else had something. So the joy that was set before him, just simple thinking, our salvation, salvation of others, Rejoice, reuniting in heaven, just so many things you could put in looking uh, for the joy that was set before him. Because of he knew his coming, he endured the cross, despising the shame. I'm going to go to one more verse and then we'll be done. First Corinthians, or excuse me, Colossians 1, verse 12. The book of Colossians is all about the preeminence of God. I won't be able to get through all of what my thoughts are, but I'm going to highlight a couple thoughts. Colossians 1, verse 12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saint. He made us able to enjoy the inheritance. Verse 13 says, He hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. He has done these things for us. And then verse 14, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The thing I love about all this, he made us meek, he delivered us, he translated us. He, in him we have redemption. Everything that was needed for salvation came through Christ. Now we know this practically, we know this theologically, we're saved, we know these things. So how does this branch out beyond the day of salvation to today? I feel like I'm falling apart and struggling, how's it branch out? Steve? Yeah.
you could hear everything he was saying, Ephesians 2.10, actually that's the one I'm going to talk to the teens about here in a moment, for we are his workmanship, I believe is created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God has for, uh, before ordained that we should walk in him. He's got a plan for each and every one of us. Sin broke that plan. God reconciled us back so that plan can be fulfilled. So the gospel starts with salvation, but it branches through sanctification. It's constantly working. The same love, acceptance, and significance that God gives us at salvation, he gives us. See, we look at the love that Jesus gave us at salvation, we think, well, yeah, he saved me then, but, you know, I've been a horrible person. I've done this. I failed. This is where we get back to Peter. Peter denied Jesus, and he's standing there waiting for Jesus to have every reason to say, how dare you? And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Go do something. The gospel is love. It's recognition of who I am, how bad I am, what God has done. But that branches on beyond so that when I feel like, when I look in the mirror and I see kind of the bad view of me, God's like, don't worry, I've got something better. His identity. But see, it starts. The whole gospel plan is to get me out of the way so that his son is what I reflect. And that's the point of the entire gospel. He's constantly working breaking away all the things the world wants, my identity, traditional, modern identity, all those things, and it's breaking down so all I see is him, and then I become more and more. I'm his workmanship. I'm created to be like him. And, so, and that we talk about that. We have to lose certain things so that we can look more and more like Christ. Yes? Okay. 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 It's that, the question, if you can't hear it, is, uh, if I understand, basically, when you get saved, the question is, if you still have the old thoughts and the bad feelings, you must not be in Christ. There's, the Bible tells us, Paul talks about it in the book of Romans, the things that I should do, I don't. And the things that I shouldn't do, that's what I do, the sin nature. That passage, and several like it, mostly First John's where it's coming from, references the idea of a lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? So he says, if any man being Christ is a new creature, old things are past, but behold, all things are becoming new. So if you find someone who's come to Christ, but 10 years down the road, they haven't changed a bit, there was no, you know, see my point? You're slowly sanctified, growing to be more like Christ. You don't ever get rid of those battles. You just grow. For instance, you're no longer drinking a bottle like you were as a baby. You see the point? You grow beyond that. An unsaved person who never says any growth towards that probably never got saved. You understand the truth, but you never truly got saved. So here's the, here's the key. I know how to get saved. I just don't do it. As a matter of fact, in Revelation, the, Matthew, I think it is, the Bible says, Jesus looked down on many at the great white right throne judgment. And they were, these are religious people that looked at Jesus and said, have we not done many marvelous works in your name? And Jesus looks down, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. They thought they had it. They did it their way, but they were never saved. And that's the key. The key is not religion, not... The truth of salvation is not found in how good I am. The truth of salvation is found is, is there slow change in growth? That makes sense? Yeah, the, the way that I read the letter, though, I guess it's annoying, the way I read it. Like, when unsaved, I know it's a process, but the way it was worded at the time, I thought it got never had one or two. No, no, okay. Yeah, it, sometimes you read it, it makes it look like it's going to be almost immediate. One of the things you have to remember in a lot of the uh, epistles that are being written, in the, especially New Testament, these letters to churches, these churches, you know, he's writing, could have been 50, 80 years after Jesus had passed, had, had died and rose again. So he's talking to people who've been saved for a period of time. And so it, that's the tricky part. When you just read through, you're thinking it's one day, one week, one month. Yeah, yeah, no. Nah. The one thing we appreciate about the gospel and about sanctification is it's not immediate. It is a process. And that's why someone brand new to church walking in, 
we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we should treat them, I should say differently, but we should accept the fact that they won't be like, hopefully, men and women in leadership. Hopefully the pastor's a little different. You know, you see, hopefully you've grown beyond that. But I hope one thing we don't ever forget. When we, one of the things that I, I love, I love watching is when new people come to church, when they get saved or they're coming back to church, this is one of my favorite parts. They come in and they're waiting for the church to look down on them because they're not at a certain level, right? Don't get me wrong. If there's a church that looks down on them, I hate that. But I love it when they come to a healthy church and they're there for a while and they're like, and they're still waiting for the other shoe to drop. They're waiting for them to be treated like that and they're not. And I, what? Because that's acceptance. That's the way it's supposed to be. And I love it because for those of us who've been saved for a while, we think we've got it all figured out. And then we meet somebody new to church and they're like, I haven't figured any of this out. I'm glad. Because it reminds us of who we really are in Christ. Right? We're not who we are because we've been in church for 50 years. We're who we are because of Christ. And when we can remember where we were. See, it's easy as Christians to say, look where I am. But we forget where we were. So trust me, that process is a, it's, it's slower than I wish it were, to be honest. Okay, I wish that I were much further and that's why when we look at the mirror, we're like, God, I don't like what I see. God's like, no, 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 no. Because here, we see what we are. God sees what he's making us to be. That makes sense? If it were any faster, we'd probably buck it. We'd probably fight it more. And, and, and he's got to fix this before he can fix this before he can fix this. Now, it is tricky in that passage because it does seem like God's saying, it's like either or. Either you have changed or you're not saved. And the premise is, the, the, the tricky part is it comes down to tense. It's a present tense changed in a constant matter. You're constantly growing. And here, I, I've said this. If someone says a prayer 20 years down the road, they're no different, probably never got saved to begin with. Some people say they lost their salvation. No, I don't think they probably ever got saved to begin with. So that process is extremely slow. But that's a great question. It's a good question. Any other questions or thoughts before I close in prayer? All right, let's have a word of prayer.